you know, to do the interviewing and, and so forth, and, and they don't know anything about the field, no, and no. Uh, so that uh, they've been quite disappointed. Alice. But, uh, Alice. Yes. I don't know. Have I got tums in my pocket? I have some. Oh. Uh, yeah, I've got some here. You don't have any. We're fully equipped also. <laughs> Tums are our favorite source of cash. Oh, you know, I'm, tight, I'm tightening myself up a little bit, and I'm going to yeah. get over that. And, uh... But, J.D., if, if you're going to chew one, we'll give you a minute then, because it'll leave oh, yeah, quite chalk on your mouth. <coughs> we're all, uh... Hmm? You can't get me home. Oh, yes, I can. I don't, I don't. But we don't want white in the corner of your mouth. Huh? I know. Yeah. Okay. There haven't been very many people that have had trouble getting me to talk. Well, uh, well that's just what we want. Uh, so, uh, I think we're... Is it is it rolling now? It's rolling just to warm up. All right, just we'll to warm up. All right, very up. good. That's all right. Well, uh, it's uh, uh, today is uh, uh, March nineteenth, uh, nineteen eighty five, and it's uh, a pleasure to uh, have you with us today, Doctor Atanasoff, and uh, Adam Nassoff. Adam Nassoff. Uh, you know, Pardon. I've uh, I practiced that last night. And I still... <laughs> the, the Bulgarians say Atanasov. Oh, yeah. They say Atanasov, but I say Atanasov. This is yeah. the anglicized yeah, version. Yeah, Ang Atanasov. Well, uh, it certainly is a pleasure to have you with us uh, to uh, uh, give us this uh, interview of uh, the uh, many contributions that uh, you have uh, made during your lifetime. And uh, we hope that... Uh, this will, uh, our conversations with you, will clarify many of the points of history in the development uh, of the uh, computer. And so with this, uh, I would like to, uh, this time, uh, have you please proceed. Well, as I look back over my life, I think I, I, I was almost born into computing. Uh, I, I, ha I had an, an interest in uh, calculation from my earliest days. Yes, incidentally, uh, uh, where were you born, Doctor? I was born in uh, Hamilton, New York. In Hamilton, New York. My father, my father was born in Bulgaria, came to this country at the age of 13, and was left alone here at the age of 15, and managed somehow to get himself through Colgate University, uh, where he met my mother, and, and I was born. <laughs> in a hill behind the university at, at, at Hamilton. Oh, yes. Have you ever been to Hamilton? No, I never have. I've been in that general area. But. Yes. And uh, uh, I, uh, well, I'll start this way. Uh, I, I was five years old and I started to school and I would soon be six in October, on October the 4th. Uh, uh, and after about a month, my mother says, let me hear you read. My mother heard me read, and she says the following. She says, I see I will have to teach you myself, her exact words. And uh, <laughs> she did for about a month. She switched me from a look-say reader to a phonics reader, and then told me that you should always use phonic reading but it's the best we have, but it's very poor in English. And when you get to spell, you will have to memorize every word. That's a very interesting point uh, there. It, she, she's a sharp woman. And uh, only a month, after a month, I took off on my own, following her advice. And uh, by the end of the year, I could read almost everything. Well, that's a re <laughs> remarkable story there. And it's a remarkable story because I don't th I think if everybody could learn to read equally rapidly, that we'd, that we'd have a lot more intellectuals in the world. Yes, of course, uh, reading is the, is the foundation for uh, almost every career. Almost everything. And uh, 
I'll pass. I'll, I'll, I'll pass in a hurry until uh, I won't take up every step of my life until I was nine years old. And my father had just got a job as a, an electrical engineer in a phosphate mining company, which was just opening in Polk County, Florida. Oh yes, that was very early in the days of phosphate mining. It really was, yes. There weren't. Uh, there were a few mines around, but not very many. This mine was just being um, uh, started. Uh, there were no houses there, but but they'd build a few houses, and we went and we took one of the houses. And what I tell you for my uh, for 1913, it just comes back from my memory of that house. And whatever I did, I could see the surround of that house, and I could tell that it was during my during 1913 when I was nine, and then the year ten years old. Uh, my dad. Uh, <laughs> Felt being an electrical engineer, but he needed another slide rule. He really didn't need one because the principal job he had was organizing the repair of the motors, which were continually uh, being burned out by the lightning. Lightning in Florida is about 100 times greater than it is in good many other places. Oh, yes, I've noticed that in my trip to Florida. Uh, I don't know. I think they've 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 done some things which uh, mitigate the effect now. But uh, at that time, it was terrible. And Dad just kept his men hard at work re rebuilding those motors. And that's that's what he was doing. So the slide rule was left for me. It was the Dietzchen slide rule. Oh yes, time honored uh, name. Yes, it, it really was. And uh, it, it had a nice. Uh, booklet that came with it, and I could read. At that time, I'd read everything in sight. I had read, well, I'd re I remember that I'd read Spencer's Fairy Queen at that stage, if you know what I mean. Yeah, so that's very, very advanced. <laughs> and uh, so I could read it, and in, in a week or two, I could do any ordinary problems on the slide rule. Uh, uh, but this didn't satisfy me. I had to understand how that slide rule worked. And of course, logarithms commenced to play a role. Now here I st almost stopped baseball. And I spent my full time, we didn't have any school because they hadn't commenced school there at the mine. And uh, I uh, studied, read, got mother to help me. At the age of nine, my mother was first class in, in algebra and uh, read on and on and on until I understood logarithms and the meaning of logarithms. I memorized the, the definition for logarithms. And then I learned how to use tables of logarithms by myself during that period. And uh, I uh, thought I was content with life for a moment, and then I realized that I really didn't know how to calculate logarithms. And I started on the project of, st of calculating logarithms. I didn't know how to go. Strangely enough, Dad didn't play much of a role in this <laughs> in oh, these yeah. events. Yeah, so he had other things. <laughs> he had other things on his mind. <laughs> and I got a hold of a book and read about logarithms, and I have the book here with me. That's remarkable. The very right? book. Yeah. The very book. What uh, What is the title of the book? The yeah. title of the book is uh, College Algebra. Oh, yeah. But College Algebra has meant a lot of things in different places. Oh, yeah. In this case, it is quite an elaborate book and analysis that, uh, that gave the various subjects of algebra. And there's a chapter in here on logarithms. And then there's a chapter, and then, there, and then there's a further a further um, uh, beginning on the calculus in this book. And I was, with just a little wit, I'd, I'd read the elementary definition of logarithm, and I was reaching into calculus and memorizing derivative. Well, that's, uh, that's remarkable. Uh, a, and this was all in a book on algebra. It was it, I did this during my ninth and tenth year. Oh, yes. And, uh, <coughs> Uh, the, the definition of, of, uh, of derivative is here, oh, yeah. and, and it's 
indelibly inscribed in my mind. Yes. Uh, well, you see, I believe you mentioned the. Uh, uh, do you have the name the uh, name of the author of that book? Sure. The name of the author is Taylor. Taylor. And oh, yeah. Taylor was. A, a, a professor of mathematics at Colgate University, and oh, yeah. this is a book my father had used. This is his book. Yeah, that's remarkable. And uh, uh, I learned how to how to do infinite series and to test infinite series for uh, termination. Oh yes. And uh, I actually calculated the logarithm of five to the base ten. Well, that's a and remarkable. At that yeah. time, I left the book. Right. Well, that is a really uh, a wonderful story. And, and you don't, and you know, I, had, I only had elementary mathematics up to that time, but my mother helped me with the algebra part. There wasn't much to learn; it didn't seem to me. And I had that head start on my uh, on my mathematics, and uh, it, it, it has followed me all my years. Yes. Well, with regard to uh, your your work on calculating logarithms and so on, uh, you certainly got into the Theory of numbers, which is so important in your chosen field, and and here I thought that if I read anything, I could learn it, and this has proven to be useful throughout my life. Fine, very good. Uh, I did a lot of other things. I studied physics and chemistry during this period, and uh, uh, one other thing that I perhaps should mention is that um, mother had a book. It has something to do with computing, you see, you'll see. Mother had a book on arithmetic, and it had a chapter in it, and it said, Numbers to Other Bases Than Ten. Oh, yes. That was the title of the, of the chapter. Oh, yes. And uh, I studied that during this year, and uh, when I, ever, ever since when I came in contact with the need for numbers with bases other than ten, I, my memory from that, Furnished stuff. It was quite a complete, quite a complete uh, treatment of that subject, and uh, uh, I haven't had to. I haven't had to go to any book since then in regard to numbers, and and as we'll see later, <laughs> when I commenced wondering, now will a computer, will, should a computer be built to the base ten, or should it be done, built to some other base? And I think I was the first one to go into that subject thoroughly, uh, and uh, I decided to use the base two. Uh, uh, this this is where my number theory came from. Yes, well that uh, that was very fortunate. You had that base in number theory uh, now there's, because uh, now there's, uh, without uh, also then the uh, <laughs> the matter of applying electronics uh, to the base two is certainly a lot better than the. Base three or ten or anything else. Well, sure, and uh, uh, I, uh, I, I later on when I decide when I in decided to investigate what uh, numbers, I mean what base should be used in, in for computing. Well, I went into the subject fairly, fairly overtly. You'll find it in my bulletin in there in my manuscript, uh, and uh, without any question, base two was overwhelmingly more advantageous than the yellow base. Oh, yes. Base. Now, another thing that happened way back in 1913, uh, the, uh, the, the, the company had a Monroe in its office. Oh, yes, at that early date. Yes. I wondered if that could be so. Uh, my memory told me so, and it told me exactly how it was, and my memory of the machine is in detail. And I, I knew it was a Monroe, but I, when I got the writing about it, I wondered, I didn't want to make a mistake. And I got a hold of somebody that's connected with the uh, Monroe Company, and he said they first commenced making Monroes in 1910. Well, that's a very interesting point. That, that uh, dates the availability. That, yes. Uh, apparently, uh, they, Monroes and Marchants were used uh, and, tremendously uh, as and the they, and, and asset. And, they you had. know, those, those machines copied European machines of similar kind. Yes. Yeah. But I never, I, I didn't have much contact with European machines. It's Monroe and Marchands mainly that I used, and the Monroe served us for many years in calculating, and it was a very good machine. And uh, now you could unhook the carriage 
Well, hook it. You pull a couple of levers here, and you could flip the carriage back, and you could look inside and see how the mechanism worked. And I did that almost immediately, and I knew exactly how it worked and how the carrier was 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 done. And, and I was learning about computing machines clear back clear back to that day. Yeah. I'm not going to be so detailed in, in my life uh, ahead. Uh, however, when I was in the tenth grade, I decided that, and I remember again. I can tell you the shape of the room where I first got this idea. The uh, it was a, a room in, uh, in 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 high school where I was attending high school, and uh, I, I I had plenty of time. I didn't have to work very hard. And I had plenty of time, and I was wondering what I'd like to do. And I decided right then that I'd be a mathematical or theoretical physicist, and that's what I came to be. Well, that's a, well I think that, that explains uh, why I, your choice now. Uh, well, when uh, uh, I'll rush ahead uh, to, uh, uh, to college, uh, my, father, my father continued to, he didn't think electrical engineering was right for me, he thought I ought to have chemistry. And I like chemistry very much, I, I read a, a book on the subject of that time, a university book, textbook on the subject, and knew it pretty well. But I, when I got to University of Florida, where the I uh, talked to the dean of engineering, and he says the electrical engineering course is the most theoretical course on the campus, and I decided I'd take electrical engineering, and did so. And I had a lot of things that did me a lot of good, this machine work and stuff of that kind that uh, served me later in connection with computing. Um, but uh, I didn't have any electronics because electronics had been started in the, in, the, in the universities of the United States, but only MIT and Caltech had had courses at that time. I didn't have a bit of work on. I knew of, of vacuum tubes and I knew roughly how they worked at that time from re my general reading, but I, I didn't have any 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 electronics. I went off to. Uh, I uh, sent out a, as I neared the end of my year, uh, uh, as I neared 1925 when I graduated from the University of Florida in electrical engineering, I sent out some uh, brochures and I got one from Iowa State College oh, yes. in Ames, Iowa. He just wrote faster than the other people. I later got one from Harvard. But uh, I took the one, but I promised the man at the University of Florida that I would take his uh, scholarship, and I did so, and went to University of Florida, and went went to the Iowa State College in the fall of 1925. Uh, during my first year at Iowa State College, we were studying the theory of real variables. I was going into a mathematics department in order to have a theoretical background for my subject. I was studying the theory of real variables, and there was a proof in there which had to do with the base 2, and I was the only man in the class that had ever had experience with base 2. I, I remember that. Everybody else had to worry, worry about that subject, and I knew all about it. That's a fascinating story. And not to the base E, but to the base 2. To the base 2, yes. and. Uh, 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 you can't use e as a base very well because it has to be a whole number. Yeah. It has to be a whole number in order uh, uh, as, a, as a base for a uh, number system. It has to be a whole number and uh, uh, equal to two or greater than two. But any whole number will do as, as a base. Well, I could easily work out the proof. Uh, I. Uh, Majored in mathematics there, and minored in and in physics. And uh, in 1929, I, in the middle of the spring semester, in the middle of the spring semester, uh, it was the end of a, a second quarter at Iowa State College. They had a quarter system there then, but in, that was in the middle of the spring semester. At uh, I went to the University of Wisconsin and took up residency and started taking three courses. <laughs> it it kind of worried the professors that I was coming in at the middle of the second semester and starting to take three courses. 
but uh, well, in the first place, Professor March knew I was knew I had a, an aptitude in various things, and I'd already had some work in it. And uh, and um, elasticity, which he was teaching. Uh, one of the other professors was teaching quantum mechanics, and I'd had uh, I'd had a I just read something about quantum mechanics, but I read it and uh, didn't think I'd make it. Couldn't think I would make it. This is Doctor J. H. Van Vleck, and I would ask a question. He'd say, "We." Finish that last semester, so he'll push me down that way. Oh yeah. So, so of course, uh, that, uh, quantum mechanics was still uh, more or less uh, brand new in its, uh, in its infancy yes. there. Oh although, yes, although, of course, Planck had uh, well, worked way there, but really the big development was right about that time. That's exactly right, and we had um, Dirac there during the during the year. Oh yes, and. Uh, uh, and people come around them and they say, I, uh, we think that the professor ought to answer you because we don't know the answer to that either, other members of the class. He had 25 members in the class, and finally we came up to the final examination and all but five of the members quit. They just resigned from the course. And I was left with the other three or four or four or five, whichever it was, and wrote the examination. Here is Van Vleck, and he doesn't know quite what to say. He says, have an answer on. He says, uh, uh, you did pretty well on the examination. He says, I suppose I ought to tell you that you did the best of anyone on the examination. <laughs> well, <laughs> and, that was remarkable. <laughs> and, uh, he was all, uh, afterwards, I, he became a major professor. Oh, yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, however, uh, I, I, I might tell a little about my thesis. Uh, the subject was the polarizability of helium. We were to take the helium atom and apply an electric field and see what electrical moment it had. Oh, yes. And uh, uh, I understood the subject all right, but you see, this wasn't a simple atom. It, wasn't, it had two electrons. and. Uh, it wasn't easy to calculate mathematically. Uh, we used uh, wave functions uh, that had been described for helium by Hillerhaus, a German physicist. And uh, I was able to convert these so they could be used uh, for uh, computing the polarizability of helium. and. Uh, uh, Van Vleck was in Europe right, during the next year, uh, but I went ahead with a professor who was from Zurich, whose name escaped me for the moment, and uh, he was just as much help as Van Vleck would have been, and uh, I finished my thesis and uh, got a PhD in the middle of the summer of 1930. Oh, yeah. PhD. Afterwards, uh, I, I, I had a, I had, I'd left memories at the at Iowa State College, and I went back to teach, back there to teach. What uh, what department? I went, I went back uh, in the mathematics department, but uh, uh, after a few months, they made me uh, a assistant professor of mathematics and physics in both departments, and then. In a year or two, they made me associate professor of, math of mathematics and physics. And I worked in both departments. And of course, the, the mathematics department was an applied department anyway, being in a school at that time, so that it was a pleasant uh, period of my life. Well, very good. So you, uh, you went right into the academic profession directly. I did that, from, yes. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I was there only a year or so, and I commenced giving teaching graduate courses in both mathematics and physics. And uh, uh, pretty soon I had postgraduate students who wanted to work with me. Uh, it was a wonderful period of life to be in, uh, just having had a PhD and, and having students come around and ask to. I was only theoretician at Iowa State College at the time. Oh, yeah. And uh, uh, people liked my courses. and. 
wanted to work with me, and I had as many students as I could handle. During the next uh, six years or so, I had eight postgraduate students who all, all but one got the PhD. Well, there weren't very many uh, uh, students uh, or professors of theoretical physics at that time in the whole country. No, the no, one, no, the one. And uh, now I was thinking about, I was thinking about what, one thing I forgot to talk about, but you know, uh, when I finally got to school at uh, the play, uh, 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 in 1909, in the summer of 1910, uh, I had a very, te a very good teacher, and I want to name her because she was extraordinary. Her name was Gertrude MacArthur, and she uh, was a. She drove everybody to the absolute limit, including me. Oh yeah, and that. That's the role of a good teacher. Yeah, that's the role of a good teacher. Uh, the uh, I uh, when I when I uh, worked on the polarizability of helium, of course, we had to use approximations on this subject, and you know, you, you couldn't get the exact answer. It was um, you had to use approximations. And on my first effort, I got a accuracy of five percent. Starting with an atom about which we knew very little at that time, and I was able to uh, nail it down and, and, and get an accuracy of 5%, and later I made a recalculation and got 2%. Well, considering uh, that you were delving into an absolutely new field there, that was uh, well, I, very I fine accuracy. felt pretty enthusiastic about it. Uh, you know, about this time when I got back to Iowa State College, I knew what I needed to know that I hadn't had. I hadn't had electronics, and I commenced to read myself into electronics. I read, the, I think, the, about the first book ever published on vacuum tubes by a man in Africa. In Africa. Oh, yes. His name was Vanderbilt. Of course, he was a... No, that, came uh, from Holland. I suppose his family came from Holland. Oh yes, mm -hmm. and uh, he wrote a a book which you'll find in in, in old libraries today, uh, Vanderbilt, and uh, I read a number of other books, and I also started to work it with my fingers. You'd think that I was that that I, that I mostly sat and thought, but I had started life with my father, and he always worked me into doing things with my own hands, and I've always found it easy. And as I stayed around the University of, uh, around Iowa State College, why, pretty quick, I was, I was, I was directing uh, experimental theses. Oh, yeah. And uh, it didn't mean a thing to me. I could move into theoretical, uh, into experimental work just as quickly as I could into theoretical work. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> had a, uh, I was going to tell you, something about what my theses were about, because it tells you what I had to do. Uh, I've got it here somewhere. Well, I... Uh, well, you've I, given us a good, uh, good description of the work, uh, so I think it was, yes. that's perfectly understandable. I, I had people who were, one man that was doing uh, graduate work in quantum mechanics. He was working on oh, yeah. lithium. Oh, yes. And uh, 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 other people were working on the theory of approximating the solutions of partial differential equations. Oh, because yeah. you understand you always had to deal with a partial differential equation in, in, in theoretical physics, and, that, and that's what I'd done in my own thesis, and, and I had given myself a lot of attention as to how to, as to, how to proceed with that. And I commenced to study new methods, new, new methods for solving partial differential equations. And I and my students invented a rather new method, which I don't know where it stands in, in the whole hierarchy of, 
of methods used for solving partial differential equations today. I, I've got to find out from somebody. I'm going over. Yes, well, uh, partial differential equations, of course, are very essential in the quantum uh, uh, theory and, and also uh, advanced thermodynamics. Oh, uh, yes, you bet. Absolutely you uh, bet. necessary. You bet, and, 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 and not, not an easy discipline. And, uh, and thermodynamics was one of the subjects I taught. Oh yeah. In in uh, uh, in, in those days, and uh, I'll tell you something else yes. about it. But I better I better shut myself off here. Right, well, that's very a little bit. interesting. Well, that's quick. Uh, I'm, I was telling you how uh, who, what subjects my graduate students worked in: uh, quantum mechanics, quartz. You know. You know the crystal quartz. Oh yes. And uh, we cut we cut them and analyze them and and and, and you know they have uh, six uh, coefficients of elasticity. It's a complex crystalline substance. Oh yes. And uh, and 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 we and and uh, I provided a method for computing all of these That's from measurements oh. and my students calculated and my students actually made this calculation. Oh, yeah. And I believe to this very day that the most complete uh, collection of the uh, elastic coefficients of quartz was done by my students and I. Oh, yeah. And uh, now, uh, you know, we when I th did a thesis, I analyzed the partial differential equation by using the Rayleigh-Ritz process. You've heard of the Rayleigh-Ritz. Oh, yeah. Sir. Well... I invented a new method to replace Rayleigh Rins. And uh, uh, then um, made it simpler so there was almost no mathematical work to be done. The only trouble was that as you attempted to solve a partial differential equation, you had to, you had to uh, solve a large system of linear algebraic equations at the end. Yeah. And the problem of solving a large system, you're going to, I'm going to talk a lot about that oh, subject yeah. in the course. Now, I also uh, uh, studied whatever computers there were around, and this included the IBM tabulator. Oh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a great big machine, and it cost the university a lot of money. And... Uh, uh, I felt as if I ought to apply that that equipment to some some of my some of my own objectives. Uh, I got a, a man in statistics named Brandt, Dr. A. E. Brandt, to help me, and we thought we would find a way find a way a physics problem that we could solve by using a tabulator. Oh yeah. Uh, With just, their, uh, let's see, uh, use the I IBM punch cards. Exactly. Yes. It, it used IBM punch cards. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, we just, uh, I thought, I thought maybe the thing to do is to use it to solve complex spectra. And then I analyzed it further, and I found out that it wouldn't do it. It was a dumb machine. It wasn't very smart. And then I thought maybe I can add some additional equipment to the. IBM tabulator and make it do it, and we did so and published a paper. Well, that's remarkable. And uh, uh, the IBM, strangely enough, IBM were not very happy at all. <laughs> we said nice things about IBM, but they weren't very happy at all. And years later, the courts forced IBM to draw every piece of paper that had the word Adonassoff on it out, and I found out that there's a piece of paper in IBM that says, keep Adonassoff out of the tabulator. <laughs> that's, that's fascinating uh, point, and we didn't, point in history. <laughs> and we didn't hurt the computer, the, the tabulator at all, and in the end it worked as well as it ever did. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, I, uh, so that you uh, then, uh, well, because that was a, a good introduction into your... Uh, uh, beginning to thinking about computers then. Yeah, I should add, perhaps I should add, that IBM wouldn't give me a copy of the internal drawings of the computer, and I just sat down and figured out how I'd have done it and proceeded accordingly, and it worked fine. Well, fine. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, 
Now we've got this, uh, my students having all these linear algebraic equations, just ordinary linear algebraic equations, but they'd have eight or ten or more unknowns in them. Yes, and that means about a week of calculating. Oh, yes, <laughs> but pretty quick it was several weeks. Yes. My students spent several weeks on those calculations, and we knew that what we needed to do was to get the, make the, the results more accurate. We had to uh, double or triple in the number of unknowns oh, yes. in them, and that looked as though it would take most of a lifetime yes. to do uh, You see, you, you didn't use determinants to solve those. Oh, it wouldn't help a bit. It wouldn't, uh, that would get so complicated. No, no, the, the, determinants, yeah. the determinants are fine in, in, in doing a theory of such of such problems, mm -hmm. but it has nothing to do with solving them. Oh, yeah. Solving them, you just have to do the numerical work. Oh, yes. And my students were making a noise about this subject. And, and I asked often, this is the greatest impulse that I ever had towards computing. Uh, uh, the uh, I commenced to examine all the computers, all the methods of calculation that were available. It took months, yeah. but in the end there was nothing. Yes, well yeah. there was the Marchant calculators and the IBM uh, tabulators, and well, I guess the, that was about I, I all. Tried to, I tried to use an IBM tabulator, but it didn't have no. the capacity, it didn't nearly have the capacity, it was slow too. Mm -hmm. And uh, Marchant, you know how what that takes, yes. and I'd, I'd used that in my own calculation of uh, helium. And uh, oh, it, it, I commenced to wonder now, you know, I, I commenced to think about uh, analog versus digital oh, computers. Yes. And I commenced to wonder if I should go into analog computers oh, for yes. solving this. A um, little analysis showed me that an analog computer, you know, Bush developed a, uh, an analog computer oh, yeah. called the differential analyzer. Yes, that's right. I believe that was the most advanced calculator as of that particular that's right. moment. That's time. right. And he'd spent a million and a yeah. half dollars on that computer. Yes. And they, he got this money from from uh, uh, Rockwell Foundation. Yes. And uh, Warren Weaver gave him the money. Do you know Warren Weaver? Oh, I've, uh, I've met him. Uh, You've met uh, Warren yeah. Weaver. As a matter of fact, I met him at your home. Warren Weaver was yes. a major was a was a professor of mine in college. Oh yes, and I've had some associations with him since. Yes. Well, I, uh, that uh, of course uh, that work uh, that was concentrated uh, in analog computers, I think, uh, probably held MIT back uh, a little bit from going into the digital. Uh, oh yes, you know why? I've argued with with uh, Bush and. Uh, his assistant called Sam Caldwell. Do you know Sam Caldwell? No, I don't. I've heard of him. Uh, Sam Caldwell. I argued with them both, and I and at this time I was getting sharper on the subject. And I said, "Analog. You know the word analog was of my invention." Oh, is that right? That is of my invention. Yeah. What did uh, What did Bush call it? Uh, I guess he called it. <laughs> he called it. Differential analyzer. Differential analyzer. Yes. <laughs> but you see, he hadn't uh, sharp, very, very he hadn't sharpened up the difference between uh, between uh, uh, an analog machine and a digital machine. Oh yes. And the word digital was not of my making. I, that wasn't my word. I called it computing machines proper. Oh yes. I called a, 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 a calculator mm -hmm. a computing machine proper. Oh yes. Uh, I mean, it, it didn't use an analog. It, it went directly at it. In a mathematical sense, oh, yeah. that was my, my word, and other people call it. And I was awfully angry because I missed that word. And other people, uh, that's a, somebody else's word. Oh, yeah. But the word analog came out of my mouth. I don't know. <laughs> it's yeah. kind of amazing, and, yeah. and I think I can prove it. Now, um, uh, I've argued with. I've, I've even. Uh, I, I was in contact with Bush, and uh, last time I saw him was in a, in. 16th and down in Washington, down oh, yes. in the center of Washington. I don't need to tell you the place well. I know. Uh, well, I looked the thing over and I knew 
that I had to build a computer and that just and I, I, I was shaken when I realized that that's what my future was. I didn't, I wasn't enthusiastic about it. I didn't want to do it. But I knew I had to. And I knew that I had the means. Some way I felt as if I had the internal means to do that. Oh, yeah. And uh, so I started in to examine the whole subject of calculation. Now, what did I do? I'm, I just sat down at a desk and started making pictures and, and thinking, making pictures and thinking. This went on for months and months, making. And uh, uh, I uh, worked on a number of subjects, and that included the subject of memory that you spoke about. And uh, I knew I had to have a relatively fast memory. I had I'd set my goal as to provide something that was several times as fast as an IBM tabulator, which was all mechanical. Which was all mechanical. That's what I set as my limit. I I mean I I didn't think about working faster. As a matter of fact, I, I made my computer machine way too slow because all the means that I induced to computing were, were very rapid. One of the methods that I induced for computing was to was in memory. Now, I knew, mathematically speaking, that uh, that <laughs> uh, depending on what base I was going to use, I would it would change the method of memory that I would probably want to use. I could see that. And so the subject of base came to the floor. And I decided I would try to find out what base to use first. I decided, you know, I've already said that I have decided to use digital machines, what we now call digital machines, which I call computer machines proper. Uh, well, when I examined the, the base, uh, I have a, 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 a mathematical theory which is contained in here, and I presume it isn't very, well, isn't very good to try to give the theory verbally, but the theory showed me that if you're doing ordinary arithmetic, that uh, the lower the base, the better. And it's only the lowest base you can use is two. Oh, yes. Uh, one of my calculations showed me that I should use the base E, but it turns out that that was a mistake. Oh, I yes. made a slave. Because it has to be a whole number. No. 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 It theoretically gave me the base E. I knew I couldn't use it as base, yeah. so I had to use either two or three. Yes. And I examined which would be better at that stage. But... It turns out there was an error in the theory that gave me the base E. Oh, yeah. And uh, when, when it comes to multiplication, the base 2 is best. Oh, yeah. The base 2 is really best. Better than E. Better, better than 3. Th now, when it comes to division, uh, theoretically, from a theoretical point of view, you could use a base of 3 or a base of 4. But... There are a lot of other things that enter this field, and uh, uh, when it comes to the question of memory, you either punch or you don't punch, that's two. If you attempt to apply that to a base E, I mean base three, or any other base, requires a complication of, like the base ten card of, of IBM's. It's something like that. You know, you know how that worked. Oh yes. Well, that's an illustration of a man using a a punch or no punch yeah. problem, uh, which really is quite suitable for base two. You're trying to use it for base ten, and it and it uses up more card than is proper. And uh, so the, the base two, we're driven again to base two. When it came to the logic system, which I will talk about later, uh, the uh, Base 2 is overwhelmingly better. When it come, came to memory, uh, it was 
much better. And so I was pretty much driven towards the base two. And when we're attempting to, to get a memory for base two, you either punch or you don't punch. Uh, you know, you, uh, you can, uh, you know, if you use a relay computer, why? It, it, it automatically works out for base two. Yeah, re relays and diodes. So. That's right. However, uh, I, I, I knew that the cheapest thing I could use would be a condenser. Oh, yeah. Point, uh, 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 so I commenced using condensers, and I'd use point zero zero three or microfarads. Oh, yes. A very small condenser. I didn't anywhere near go to the bottom. I could have used much smaller condensers than I did use, as a matter of fact. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the time before, uh, let's talk about uh, uh, the condensers that I did use. It would take, uh, oh, 40, 50 seconds for the uh, signal to die off in a condenser of that size. And uh, now... What kind of uh, these were... Foil or were they electrolytic? They were, they were, they were on paper. The ordinary paper, any ordinary yeah. paper condenser worked. Mm -hmm. I didn't have, I have a bit of trouble with any kind of a condenser. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, everything worked. Oh, yes. Uh, of course, the, uh, uh, I, I, I knew that that one really was, uh, that this was complicated because the condensers would die off. And I had to find some way of keep keeping them from dying off. Oh, yeah. Now, the, the, my original purpose would would have a would be to use a spring or something of the kind that could snap into one of two positions, have a low a low potential here and then higher and then a low potential here, and you could snap it from this position to that position or that position to this position, and and change from zero to one or one to zero. Uh, that requires a system with two minima. Of, of potential energy. You see what I'm driving. Oh yeah, surely. Uh, they, uh, that was what I had first thought I would do, and then I ha and then I was driven by the little boy going to the grocery store. Little boy going to well, the grocery because your your condensers are going to uh, just like the little boy, uh, like the little boy, it peters out. Oh yes, runs down. And the little boy's memory runs down, and he doesn't know what his mother told him to do. So what the little boy does is he starts to the grocery store. He repeats what his mother told him. And he repeats it at such frequent intervals that he doesn't have time to forget between times. Oh, yes. And having had this practical idea yeah. in my mind, yeah, oh, yeah. I immediately commenced to put this in electronic shape. Yeah, oh, yeah. And I built condensers into circuits that had this property. Every, at frequent intervals, they would test what they were and put themselves in the most desirable state. Oh yes. Pull themselves up. Mm -hmm. So you had to uh, you had to read what was uh, in it. on the condenser, and then at the and same time uh, regenerate, re the, regenerate original, the charge because the, the it was going down. So now you you got you it. had to do that within the fifty seconds. Yeah, oh yeah. So. Uh, as a matter of fact, I did it at one second intervals. Oh, what? Oh, I see. But our present computers do exactly the same thing. They've got a little condenser in there, and it will wash out. But they have refresh cycles, which are continually flipping through the system, yeah, and are bringing them back to the original yeah, state. I didn't know that. that yeah. That's the way they are made. That's, uh, you know, that isn't true of all memories yeah. in modern computers. I'm telling you something out of yeah. place here a little bit. You know, the magnetic memories wouldn't die off because of time. Yeah. However, when you, uh, I could say that if you reach in and take out the charge, why then you have to recharge it in that state in order to have it retain its original value. Oh, yes. Yeah. That was a complex, yeah. complex situation on on magnetic, uh, uh, on magnetic cores, yes. magnetic cores were like that. Uh, well, uh, now 
I worked on a lot of things here, which could possibly be I, I, for months and months. I guess for a year and a half or two years, I was working on just little giblets of elements which could be put into a computer, and I, uh, I had yet in mind how I could build a computer. I didn't have in mind how I would ever reach my goal, and. I went out, and I'll tell you what happened. I went out to my office one evening in the middle of the year in 19, in the middle of the winter of 1937-38, and I sat down at my desk and attempted all my stuff around them, you know, connection with computers, and I tried to work on this and tried to work on that, and I became extremely irate, irate with myself. And I was upset to an extreme degree, and then I did something that I have done only two or three times in my life. I went out and got into my car and started to drive. It was 20 degrees below zero, but there wasn't a bit of ice on the pavement. It was all dry, and I drove hard for several hours, driving hard enough so that I couldn't think about computers. I had to think about the road and I was able to mitigate my unhappiness that way. And at last I said, well, I don't ask if this is going far enough. You've got to do something. And then I glanced over, and I was crossing a bridge 189 miles from my starting point. Well, you really, really did, uh, you really traveled. Uh, <laughs> oh, I traveled at 80 or 90 miles an hour yes. in a Ford V8 of the era, and uh, I had a good heater in there, and I was comfortable. It was extremely cold. It was 20 degrees below zero. Oh, somebody has analyzed my situation. They said I was looking for a drink. Well, I, I wasn't looking for a drink until I glanced over and saw the water, and then I said, well, you're going into Illinois, and of course you can get a drink in Illinois. And I went on, and there was a honky-tonk side of the road. Oh, and with a, within a quarter of a mile, there was a honky-tonk in Illinois. Oh, yeah. And I drove in and walked, shut up, uh, parked my car and walked in, and, and I had a heavy coat on, a very heavy coat. And I remember the strength with which I raised it to the hook. It was plenty heavy on my hand as I raised it to the hook. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I sat down and ordered a drink. And all of a sudden, I realized that my mental capacity had improved markedly. That I could think things through. I knew immediately that I could think things through. And I knew immediately what I had to do. And I sat right down and started to work on the computer. And worked on it continuously for three hours. And people say, did you have any paper? I don't remember any. I didn't have any, need any paper. Everything that I, everything I did, I remembered perfectly, and I got up and drove home at a slower rate. And I had, I had come to four conclusions while I sat there in the honky tonk. Well, that's I, a remarkable story there. Four conclusions. What were those conclusions? <laughs> I ought to find it here because you know it's just like me to forget one of them. Uh, Yes. In the first place, you may not think this is much of a conclusion, but I decided I would not do a mechanical system, but I would do an electrical system. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, this may not seem as though it was a great step forward. Uh, I had some, some letters from members of the IBM staff, and, the IB and a member of the IBM staff told me that IBM would never build an electric computer. Mm -hmm. Never build an electric computer. In spite of custom, I would use base two. I was going to translate the problems that I had in base ten or base two and do the calculations of base two and translate it back. I would use capacitors for memory, but I was going to use what I told you about the little boy. There would be a mechanism there that would test what it was at frequent intervals and restore it to its original form. 
And I would, and this last one came originally from the, these other things I'd thought about before, but I was finalizing when in my mind as I was sitting there, I would compute by logic action and not by enumeration. I was going to build a logic system into my computer. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't have the remotest idea, but here's a box, and it had leads going in and leads coming out, and into it you put the initial quantities, and out would come the final quantities. And the uh, machine was uh, was uh, was a, a logic a logic based computer. Oh yeah, so that those was, uh... and now uh, when I got home, I had these four items, and I commenced examining each of them in detail. And this went on, not merely for a month, it went on for a number of months, because I, I could do part of them, part of them I already had answers for, but when it came to the logic system, I had to start from the beginning and build a logic system, and that took me months. And as I look back over that era, I realize that these four, four steps that entered my mind at the honky tonk are in every computer today. Yeah, that's right. They're pretty fundamental things in it. Yeah, to pretty me. fundamental. Yeah. And I, I, I was delighted when I found that out. And I didn't find it out till two or three years ago. Oh yeah. That they that every computer has every one of these. Of course, as long as they had magnetic cores, that doesn't quite fill a bill. It would yeah. be off on one. But as far as but as far as all the rest go, the the uh, dynamic memory, you know, has little capacitors in there. Oh yeah. And the refresh cycle is exactly according to my principle. Oh yes, that's amazing. And uh, I then knew when I had when I had gone through these consequences of my trip to the Roadhouse and had had actually now. Can you imagine me sitting down and drawing out vacuum tubes without ever putting a vacuum tube to a circuit? I finally got it to where I could, where it would work. And that was the state it was in. I hadn't ever tried it mechanically. I never, I hadn't. Uh, I could have very easily. I was good at the art. But I didn't feel I needed to because I knew exactly how a vacuum tube would work in that circuit. And so all I had to do was to draw out the circuits and, and, and plan it. And then I decided that I, could go no, I couldn't go further by myself. I had to have some help. And uh, I commenced approaching the authorities at Iowa State University College at that time. And uh, I was walking across the campus and I saw a member of the electrical engineering department named Harold Anderson. I can show you within a foot of where I stood at that time. And uh, I said to Harold, this is what I'm up against. I've got to have some help. Can you make any suggestions? Harold Anderson took a minute. Always a very careful man. He took a minute, maybe a minute and a half, thinking it all over. And he says, I've got your very man. He said, his name is Clifford Berry. Oh, yeah. And that's how you got together. And that's with how Barry. I got Clifford Berry. That's how I got Clifford yeah. Berry. I suppose we had to ask Clifford if he'd agree, but if there wasn't any problem. I had Clifford Berry. And uh, that was in the spring of 1939. And I, de I decided I, would, I could employ Clifford Berry. And uh, he couldn't stop work until fall. He started work in September, and before the end of the year, October, November, December, he had the circuits working. He really put them together fast. Not much of a computing machine, just the mere rudiments of yeah. computing machine. But it showed that my precepts of how it should go together were right. Oh, well, that's uh, that's remarkable. So. He, so then you actually had a breadboard, uh, a breadboard. arrangement there. Yes, we have, a the, uh, we have a picture of it in oh, here. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
this picture of the breadboard in here. Fine, I was wondering if you could open it up to that picture and then hold it against your chest and we'll <laughs> zero in on it. For can, you zero, can you zero oh, in? Oh, yes. Uh, I can, can do that. Zoom, zoom right in. Uh, <clears throat> here it is. Fine. Oh, yes. Uh, then you can surely, oh, very good. Well, Can you see it all yes, right? We've got a good record. Uh -huh. Yeah, it fills the whole frame. And uh, now that was, we didn't have a picture of it. This is my memory. Oh, yeah. And it was done by an artist oh, yeah. who put things together, but he did it according to my memory. And uh, really, this is, this is what a computing machine is about. Oh, yes. This is. And uh, <coughs> so you, <coughs> you've got all those. Uh, uh, those elements uh, put together uh, there. Uh, uh, I was able to actually assemble them at yeah. that stage. Yes, uh -huh. and uh, you were certainly able to test the various components. Sure. Them, uh, now, yeah. as far as putting numbers in, you had to just touch a wire in there oh, yes. to put a number in. Mm -hmm. it, it would it only do that. I didn't have any. I didn't build any uh, equipment to uh, to put numbers in or take numbers out. Oh yeah. Uh, and and when I wanted to see what was in there, I had to. Test the condensers by means of uh, by means of a voltmeter or a vacuum tube voltmeter or something. Well, and, that's very. And that that's all that's all it took uh, at that stage. So well, that's uh, that's a remarkable story. Uh, then uh, fine. Well, then uh, uh, what uh, uh, what was your uh, your next step after you had? Um, Got all the uh, all these and, and tested and so forth. Well, you know, my, my my purpose was to make a machine solve solve system, linear systems. Oh yes. And that was the next step was to build a machine specifically for that purpose. Oh yes. And we did that. Oh yes. And uh, we we uh, uh, I should I should also. As long as you're looking at the picture of that machine, why we ought to, we ought to. Uh, uh, here's the here's the circuit that did the jogging. You ought to you ought to tell you ought to oh, yes. uh, make a yeah, zero in on that. Uh, that's as far as you can get. Good, good. Well, that's fine. That's zero. Really and then very I had to, you know, I had to build a logic circuit to go on that. Yeah. And here's the logic circuit. This is exactly the way I drew it before I ever had Cliff and Barry there. This is exactly the way I drew uh, I, I drew it. Very very complex. Uh, it's getting kind of complex, yes. and this is for the base two. And if you attempted to build a logic circuit for the base five, oh, yeah. it's much more oh, yeah. complicated. Oh yes, well, and you'd soon run out of vacuum tubes. Yes. And yeah. Right, <laughs> you'd soon run out of vacuum tubes. And this one took uh, 14, 14 uh, trials. Oh yeah. Uh, Thirteen trials, I think it was. I've got fourteen here in the picture, but it, I had my trials came two in a bottle. Oh yes. So I had to have fourteen. And uh, over on the next, uh, the next page is some uh, some uh, uh, table which shows how the thing works. Oh yeah. I'm, I don't think that I, I, I have had to try to uh, put together for a court procedure, uh, uh, a treatment of this subject, do you know such circuits are put together today by using a complex algebra which is called what? You know what it is. And I, Boolean algebra. Boolean algebra. Oh, yes. <laughs> Boolean algebra, right. Mm -hmm. Right. But you know what? I'd already studied Boolean algebra, but it didn't help me in that. Oh, I see. I just didn't make the connection. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I guess the use of Boolean algebra came a little later, but it was such a valuable tool once yes. it and and today. and it's and, a, and it's the very thing that I was perfectly capable of doing, yeah. but I just didn't do it. Yes. Uh, uh, I. Uh, Clifford. Uh, so now, uh, you understand. Barry uh, 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 worked right with you there. Yes, he did. Uh, now we had, we you understand, we were on a meager budget. We didn't have any money. Yeah, yeah. And here we are doing it. Uh, nobody else has put a computer.
his computer together for the sum that we did. Oh, yeah. So we, you, you then uh, uh, built the machine uh, to uh, using these uh, computer principles for the specific purpose of solving these uh, yes. linear equations. You know, the lawyer said that is a special purpose machine and should not be considered with the general purpose machines oh, yeah. with which you are comparing it. Oh, yeah. the, my uh, opposing lawyer was saying oh, that yeah. thing to me. Oh, yeah. Now I've got a story to tell you about that. Babbage worked very hard for a good many years on computers. Oh yeah. He didn't build much of anything. He just did what I did, that is he made pictures. Oh yeah. And uh, after he was dead, uh, the parliament wondered if they hadn't been hadn't mistreated him. They knew he was a great man and they wondered if they hadn't mistreated him. So they got together a committee to decide whether at that date they should build a, a Babbage machine. Oh yeah. So the machine, that committee uh, droned on and finally decided that the drawings were not sufficiently accurate so that they could build the machine. It wasn't like my machine, which yeah. is in vacuum tubes the cliff could build it. It oh, wasn't yeah. like that. It was yeah. something more complicated. Yes, yeah, uh, very complicated gear system. And then the following meeting took place. Someone rose and said if that machine would only solve linear algebraic equations, we ought to build it because those, uh, those, that subject is of greatest importance to man. Oh, yeah. They agreed on that subject, but they couldn't see how the Babbage machine would ever solve linear, linear algebraic equations. Oh, yeah. But I immediately turned my machine the moment I had a grasp of how it would go together. I immediately turned it in that direction. Oh, yeah. I didn't even know this story at the time I did it, either. I just blundered in. Oh, yeah. This is what I'm going to tell, well, you, tell you next. Let's cut yeah. off. Uh, did you take the time, or was it not? No, I didn't. I'm all right. I... Oh, yeah. Right? Fine. Well, uh, to continue, uh, this, uh, uh, this has been, you've brought up some very fascinating uh, points, and uh, so if you would just expand on that, I think it would be you very You realize that, that the motivation, my motivation in studying computing machines was to solve uh, large systems of linear algebraic equations. Oh, yeah. It's just like x plus 2y equals 7, and oh, uh, x minus uh, 3y equals 15. Yeah. Something, that's, that's two, uh, two unknowns and two equations. But when we go to the time, place where we've got uh, 10 equations and 10 unknowns, and from there on up, uh, we have something that can't really be done by man satisfactorily. It takes too long. And uh, I, uh, uh, we've got to have, employ the use of machinery. And I was aiming in that direction, aiming at the, at the, at, at the desire of the people who investigated Babbage uh, that we would have a machine to do such processes. Uh, this is a kind of a complex part of my uh, 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 of my story. Uh, in the first place, we'll we'll just say a few words about linear algebraic equations. Uh, uh, things you know what we ordinarily do in solving such systems is to uh, uh, use the equations which we have in pairs and eliminate one unknown between a pair. We can always do that. Now, it consists of, of this. You have a pair of equations and by a proper combination of adding or subtracting the coefficients and the, and the constant term, in a specific way, it will eliminate one of the unknowns. Yes. That's the process. And that's the standard process. It works very well, except when you get to three or more, it gets very <laughs> laborious. Pretty tiresome. Now, I guess the main part of it, you, you know, way back, I, I, I thought that I would attempt to, do, to solve this problem. I, ha I didn't mention it before, but I thought I'd solve it by using, a, a, say, 15 or 20 
uh, Monroe's. They all have a common a common axis. I, I give them all to the same axis, oh, yeah. so they'd all turn together. Uh, that looked as though it was a possible uh, approach to this subject, and I could have done it, but uh, the problem of getting the numbers into and out of the Monroe's was too complex, and all, also had to be mechanized before we get anywhere else. Oh, yeah. Now, uh, uh, suppose we had a pair of equations and, and the initial coefficient was two in one case and three on the other. We multiply the first one by uh, the first one by uh, three and the first, second one by two and subtract them. And the first uh, first uh, uh, on the coefficient of the first term would become zero, and so it could, would be eliminated and would have the problem solved. Yes, well, that's very, very simple for two equations. Yes, to one, no? <laughs> yes it is. Now, however, let me say that you could take any linear combination of two equations and it would have the same answer as the original system. Oh, yeah. Any linear combination, would you please? Uh, I had to try to, I had to try to bring that to realization. Now, uh, you know, multiple, uh, in, in computing, we all know that multiplication requires uh, successive additions and changes of the uh, 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 changes of the uh, uh, power to which we have to raise ten if we're using base ten numbers to to get to that particular element. Uh, I spent a long time thinking how how I could do it, and strangely enough, I came to the following. Answer. I would do it by division. Oh yes. By division, I would take one co uh, take the first equation and divide it by the second one. Oh yes. And as I did the division, what would be left over would also be an equation. What would be left over if you take all the way across the the array of coefficients? would also be an equation which would with the same coefficient. But if I divided properly, while well, the division would go to zero and hence would eliminate one unknown. Oh yeah. And that's you're understanding it perfectly. Yeah. And, and I, 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 I did this yesterday. I, I applied this over again yesterday mm -hmm. as to how I would say it and I'm I see I'm succeeding with you and that yes, pleases me immensely. Well that's fine. Uh, uh, now I ought to tell you this that ordinarily and computing uh, you subtract, uh, you, you subtract uh, 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 the, the divisor off of the dividend a until the dividend carries through, carries through. You know, you've gone too far, you've gone one step too far, and then you add it back in until and, and back in until it was just before it carried through and then you would shift to a uh, to a different power of 10. Do you see what I'm driving at? Yes. Right. And then you would you would subtract and subtract until it carried through then you would add it back in until it... Now this process is what is called ordinary division with computers. Ordinary division with computers. But I decided that this process was too was too complicated. And I invented a new process, and this was an invention of mine. Uh, I would subtract until it carried through, and then I would shift, change to a different power of ten, and then instead of adding, I would sub I mean instead of subtracting, I would add until it carried through. And with this series of numbers, I could uh, get the same result as the formal one. Oh, yeah. And this is called this is called uh, uh, division. Let's see, Alice. What is this division? My wife's got the words. Oh. You know, this is where I. Uh, algorithm? No. No, 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 no. <laughs> No. Well, uh, well, never mind. We'll uh, it'll it'll. Let's come. see. Yeah. I'll I'll get it in just yeah. a moment. Let's see. Uh, 
Now, do you know these two methods are used today in computation? I invented them. I'll be there. That's and they're both available on most machines today. Mm -hmm. You can use either system of division that you please. Oh, yes. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's actually uh, and built into the... Uh, in the computing uh, into mechanism. Into the computer uh, uh, mechanism. And uh, I could do it with... Let's see. We have some words for that. The words escape me. Um, well, what are you going to do? That's, <laughs> all, that's all right. Uh, <laughs> I'll have it in a little bit. Turn it off a moment. I'll, I'll repeat that. Uh, where you ordinarily would subtract until it carries through and then add it back. And that's called restoring. Oh, yeah. And, and that's called restoring division. Oh, yeah. And ordinary computers today will do that if you wish. But they also do the other which I invented and which consists of, of uh, instead of restoring it, why well, you leave everything just as it was, but you, next time you add until it carries through. Oh, yeah. And the next time you subtract until it carries through. And this is called non-restoring division. And it was non-restoring division that I invented. Yes. And those are built into the so-called read-only memory uh, in most computers. Then. That's right. And uh, so... In order to save time, I, I, I use a second process which saves, well, it doesn't save so much with base 10 because you only save one step in, in five steps. But if you're using base 2, it saves half your time oh, because yeah. you, you, <laughs> you do it so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It saves half your time if you, if yeah, you so use non-restoring yeah, division. That's uh, very interesting. That, uh, uh, with base 10, you know, it's not so important, but with base 2, it's very essential. Very very effective, yes. Mm -hmm. And I invented the uh, non-restoring division. All right. Now, I, I arranged the, uh, the, the new computer so that it would have uh, 30 fields. I would work up to, I couldn't work to 30 equations and 30 unknowns. I could only work to 29 equations and 29 oh, unknowns. Yeah because it had to have some place for the constant term. Sure. And in the 30 fields, one place would be for the constant term and the other for all the other coefficients. Oh, yeah. So I arranged two drums, mm -hmm. uh, each, of had, each of which had 30 fields yeah. and, uh, would, would, uh, and could be used up to 29 equations and 29 unknowns. And you put one equation in one drum and another equation in the other drum and connecting the two drums was the logic systems which I have previously given yeah. and you could just add add the uh, add the let's let's one of the one of the key one of the uh, uh, drums is called a keyboard and I needed a word oh now to go in there and I call it a keyboard of Bacchus and the other one is called a counting of Bacchus and uh, those are the two names of them so I'll just use those names oh, here yeah. and uh, uh, all I had to do was rearrange so that it commenced to divide a pair, of, uh, say the first coefficient in each equation, uh, divided the two of them until that coefficient was dropped to zero. And when that coefficient had dropped to zero, you know the remainder in, in division after you to carry it down long enough drops to zero. Yes. Well, this is uh, and that, a very, very and, good explanation. And that, oh, gosh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, and incidentally, I'm just uh, amazed that uh, the such a uh, an operation of 29 equations and 29 unknowns, uh, as I visualize, that's take a person a lifetime. It would take more, more major part of a lifetime to work it out and be sure everything was right. So uh, it's an amazing uh, uh, and new tool. That, that's exactly what I was aiming at. And I built this machine, and we can show, we can show the picture here. Here's the machine, and its last photograph. And I, I will use this photograph to tell something about it. that was taken and I have I have the negative of this these, these pictures came from various sources but this particular picture I have the negative Wait. 
Yeah, we'd like to see that a little, yeah, a little bit more. Slightly, yeah. That's correct. Good. We've got a good picture of it now. Mm -hmm. Fine. Now, this is is uh, principal parts of the machine, and here's one of the drums, and the other drum was inside of this case. Oh yeah. And uh, here is here here is a card reader. We put the numbers into the machine in base ten, oh, yeah. and it was taken over by the card reader, and then the machine converted to base two. Oh yeah. And I had to build a a special system for changing from base ten to base two. Oh yeah. And it would work in either direction. Mm -hmm. Now. Uh, it kept the numbers uh, for the given system of equations. It kept the numbers on a, a scratch pad memory. And this is a scratch pad memory. One of these things writes a memory on a card, oh, yeah. punching it on a card, and the other one reads it. Oh, yeah. And so in that way, we would keep track of, of, of the numbers as we pass through the entire process of, of solving it. Oh, that's uh, very ingenious. And... Uh, 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 this uh, I had to invent everything. Uh, I couldn't buy anything. Yeah. Nothing was available, and so I invented a scratch pad memory. And a scratch pad memory consisted of of, uh, of having a card pass below a s series of terminals, and, and and I put a high spark discharge through the paper, and this made the record. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, Clifford uh, Berry work, uh, was very interested in this and worked on that. And we, we thought we had this, uh, this uh, scratch pad memory to uh, perfected. We tested it. But when we finally came to the final machine, it was correct always except one part, uh, one, one place in one place in 10 to the fourth or 10 to the fifth. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So there was an error in the scratch pad memory. As far as I know, this is the only error that existed in the final machine. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, now, uh, in other words, you just you, you it would record all the all, all the coefficients in base two on on one and on one of these, and would pick it up in the other and put it back in the machine for the next step in oh, yeah. the procedure. This is the way the machine worked. Well, re remarkable. That and uh, so then uh, you could. Feed the uh, feed these things in. You fit, you convert uh, decimal to uh, binary. Perform the and then, and after you after you once have converted it, it came on a base two card, mm -hmm. and you just put base two cards in until the machine was, until the problem was solved. Oh yes, well that's a very uh, interesting story there. Now let's see. Here's a, a picture which uh, may portray some some. Oh, yeah. uh, Gives you a very good. You might like to take uh, this picture right. and add it to the. Good, we've got that. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, this was made from my memory uh, by an artist also. Oh, yeah. Fine. Now this, I'll, I'll say this concludes the mechanical operations of building the machine. Fine. Very good. Uh, that in the course of building this machine. I, uh, money got to be more and more a problem, and so I decided I would write a, uh, a write up a description of the machine, uh, and this was as of that day, and it was this uh, this is a, is that description. Oh yeah. I've got to change the tape here. Just mm -hmm. take a second. Does that mean you have an okay. hour? Yeah. It's still going. I've got to read three three minutes. Yeah, let's see. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's good. Right. And then we just put it in the, in the, the, uh, the next tape. Mm -hmm. And right. uh, uh, in, in 1954, Alice? Yes. Was it 54 or 56? 54. 54. I was visited, oh, but this time I had left the Naval Ordnance Laboratory and started a company of my own. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. I got but a in the meantime, let's see, uh, uh, Dr. Mockley had left the Naval Ordnance to go. Oh, you know, he yeah. only worked temporarily once a week for Naval Ordnance. Oh, oh, I see. He was only down there. Yeah, uh, I'm, I, I'm sorry. I didn't exactly. I, I wanted to clarify that. Yeah, he was working for, uh, for, the, for the university. Yes, uh, up, up at Philadelphia, yeah, all the time in the University of uh, Pennsylvania. And I, uh, 
I have also discussed this matter with uh, Arthur Burks. Do you know oh, yeah. who he is? Oh, yes, I've heard him. Yeah. Well, Arthur Burks was there with Markley at the University of Pennsylvania. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, he can't quite understand why Markley was coming down to see me either. <laughs> it's all a very tricky spot. But I got a, 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 a visit this morning, and oh, I'd started a company of my own, and uh, uh, I got a, a, somebody, a patent attorney from IBM came by and uh, wanted to talk to me. And uh, this was about 1954, you said. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, he says uh, he, he had found out about Markley's patents. And he says, if you'll help us, we'll destroy the Markley patents because they were derived from you. Mm -hmm. Those were his exact yeah. words. So it's I a can matter of being derived. His patents were de directly derived from you. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. I wasn't quite sure how I should react. Mm -hmm. I hadn't myself formulated that opinion. Mm -hmm. It was his, him speaking. Yeah. Uh, I said, I can't. I, I can help you, but I can't work full time with you because my my staff and I have put all the money we've got into this company and we've got to make a success of it. Oh, yeah. And uh, he wrote me one letter and I answered him. And he wanted to get my original notes and I didn't know where they were. The notes that contained oh, yes. mm -hmm. I didn't. I didn't know where they were at the moment. I had been confused and moved here and there and I had... Stuff. I know how that works when you move, you lose a lot of things. That's right, and, and, and it was all in... Uh, okay, so they abandoned me and proceeded and paid Monklin Eckert a sum of money mm -hmm. to secure the rights from them. Mm -hmm. This is IBM. IBM got its rights in that way. Oh, yeah. Uh, then we'll pass on to the time that uh, I, uh, uh, the 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 the, pat, uh, the, uh, the Markley and Eckert patents had been transferred to. It was a Sperry, uh, Sperry, Sperry Rand. Rand. I'm trying to say Sperry Rand. Yes, uh, and uh, let's see. And uh, well, however, the patent did not come out until quite late, as I remember. Very late. It was '64 or something like yeah. that. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I, I'm sorry I can't give you the exact date, well, but I, it was uh, very yeah. very late, just as you say. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I didn't memorize those. So yeah. I have to memorize them. Uh, but uh, 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 Spare Rand, uh, a good deal of water go going through the dam. Oh, yes. And Spare Rand was attempting to, to collect a billion, a billion dollars in royalties. Mm -hmm. That's a nice round sum. Yes, a nice round sum. <laughs> Well, two of the people that they made, uh, they selected two, two, two companies that they didn't think had much power, uh, that they could beat down and then collect the royalty from the rest. Oh, yes. And that was Control Data and, and Honeywell. Oh, yes. Now, both Control Data and Honeywell... <laughs> were willing to go a little bit higher than uh, than nominal patent fees, but they oh, weren't yes. willing to go any further, and they rebelled. Oh, yes. And uh, attorney named, what else? Kirkpatrick, Kirk for Control Data, had read a book, the first book published on the patents of the era by... Richard. Who? Richard. By Richards, oh, yes. and so he, uh, he found out where I was, and the control, he immediately came up to see me, and uh, so they, he talked to me, and he introduced me to the uh, uh, people at Honeywell, and the people at Honeywell were talking to me, and pretty soon we, 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 we were uh, sh shaking the woods. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, thing ended up by my agreeing to act as witness for the two companies. Mm -hmm. So it was it a joint action on the part of Honeywell? No, it wasn't. No. Separate actions. Separate actions. Yes. And uh, during this period, I heard from Mockley. I hadn't heard from him for a good while. 
Oh, yeah. I heard from Mockley. <coughs> Mockley says, I'd like to come in and see you. I'd like to bring up, uh, one of my patent attorneys in to see you. And he, in the end, I won't go through the details, oh, yeah. but in the end, he came down and brought the patent attorney with him. And uh, we talked for a while, and then we had lunch. Alice prepared us a lunch, and then we talked some more. And the man's name, the, the patent attorney, was named Dodds. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And Dodds was a patent attorney for both, uh, for both Honeywell. No, he was uh, an attorney for control. Was Barry? IBM. Uh, no, not, not, not IBM. Barry. He was Sperry Rand. Sperry Rand. He was a patent attorney for Sperry Rand in both of these cases. Oh, yeah. Is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, in the course of the discussion, but well, this time I had read, I had read a good deal of more material and I had the original patents. And I told Dodds he couldn't possibly win. I just flatly told Dodds he couldn't possibly win. You know, it's very strange. Most people would have been irate and, uh, and offensive, but Bob wasn't irate and offensive at all. And he became a firm friend and is today. Oh, yeah, that's a very interesting point there. He, he, uh, I, I to explained exactly why he couldn't win, and, and he didn't win for those exact reasons. Yeah, he must have been a little devastated seeing this billion dollars he, he, sort of uh, yes, float away. That's right. Oh, yes. He was, he was just as gentle and nice as he could be to me. And... Uh, he wasn't regarded as a very gentle man, but he was in my case. And and, and, the, and the last time I was, I was entered in a court procedure, he insisted that Alice and I meet his wife after the after the after the court was over. Oh yes. Uh, to just show how much he became my yeah. friend mm -hmm. as a result of having this conversation yeah. with him, and he found out I was exactly right. Yeah. You uh, you, you could talk about the the uh, the judge not being smart. He didn't have to be smart if he could just read ordinary English, oh, yeah. because it was very clear that uh, Mocklin had put together a patent case and it had been accepted. You know why I didn't have a patent? I didn't have a patent because I would take college force me to sign a patent contract with them and refuse to uh, pursue the patent. Oh yes, mm -hmm. they but neglected the very important uh, thing. Ne there. Neglect, and I shouldn't have stood for it, but I did. And well, at any rate, uh, how uh, how long did this patent suit go on? Then? It went on for a year. Oh yes. It went. I guess it actually it actually sat for ten and a half months. Mm -hmm. It actually the, the judge was present on a court procedure for ten and a half months. I was there only during part of this time, oh, yeah. and I can tell you some detail of, of my controversy with opposing counsel. I don't know whether that is a good thing to. And your well, fine, but uh, the essentially the uh, the net effect was so that uh, uh, as a result of your uh, uh, notes and documentation. By this uh, time, I've accumulated all my documents, including this. Oh yeah. One of my original papers. That particular one must have been a devastating document. And well, it, the whole thing, the whole thing, just put them in position. Where they didn't have a chance. Mm -hmm. The they had they didn't. But this time they gotten rid of Dodds and had a very aggressive counsel. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. And treated me very badly mm -hmm. in the course of. Oh, yes. <laughs> but it didn't really matter. Yeah. Uh, I stood it. I don't know what they they might have they might have conceded that by putting a hard attorney against me I'd break down. But of course I don't break down. I just <laughs> slowly yeah. pat pat along and. Uh, when the court procedure was over, why well, I went over to shake hands with opposing counsel, and the man hated like everything to shake hands with me, and finally got his hand up. He he he, he perhaps knew better than I did at that mm -hmm. stage yes. that my testimony had been overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Well, it, your both your uh, both your testimony and uh, of course uh, your documentation in the form of these reports. Uh, should have been very... Uh, now, let's see. Let's just name a couple of things that Mockley attempted to steal from me. Oh, yes. In the first place, he actually... My... What kind of division? Non-restoring. What? Restoring, non-restoring. Uh, restoring. I had this not-restoring and non-restoring division. Oh, 
Oh, yeah. And he copied it into his patent claims. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he got a patent on it. Oh, yeah. But, of course, the, when that judge got through with it, there was no patent there. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, his jogging, they used my jogging. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a very important principle. And do you know what? He used base 10. He didn't use base 2. Oh, that's interesting. And he used... He, he didn't use logic system. He, he, he just counted. Oh, yeah. He had a, a, a machine that would just count. Mm -hmm. And But the rest of the story was that I outlined for Mockley if I needed a a differential analyzer, I would build it according to these principles. Mm -hmm. And Mockley copied that into his ENIAC. Oh, yes. He also copied that into his ENIAC. Oh, yes. And uh, uh, by this time, uh, well, they, they, you know, his wife now has written an article which was in this publication. Oh, yes. Which, the annals. Which showed that he had done digital computing before he saw me, oh, but yeah. Mockley told told me that he'd never done digital computing at the time he was at my house. Yeah, and well, so, was there any documentation of it? Uh, he did no reports or anything. She claims to have some, but uh, it hasn't it hasn't entered into a court procedure, and I don't believe most people believe it. Yeah. Believe she, I think she's innocent. I think Mockley told her that. Before he died, and she's written that since he's died. Oh yes, so there's a very interesting historical controversy here. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's. Uh, but uh, as I say, uh, I think your documentation uh, on this is. Uh, you you read the judge's well, decision. Oh yes. In here. Yes. And uh, it shows. Oh, the judge had been put up for the, a Marconi Award. Oh yes. Judge Larson has written a, a letter commending my uh, commending me for that award. Oh yes. At the present moment, this has happened. Oh yes, that's very interesting. What else should we tell him, Alice? Now, uh, let's see. Uh, I am going to um, cut it off for a minute. Let me try on the 